Keith, thank you for inviting me back. I spoke at the, uh, the Lisbon event um, last year, and I spoke on the value of 2.4. And I didn't realize it was such a controversial topic. So I figured if I got invited back again, I'd pick a very bland, non-controversial topic that we all agree on. Dual five gigabits access points. I'm good, I'll, I can just do that. So everybody agrees that's a wonderful thing, right? See, I'm gonna make you guys talk. You know, this is, it depends. Thank you very much. No, it actually is a wonderful thing. The last speaker, um, who was that? Chris. He was talking about, you know, how difficult it is to um, deploy 1,200 APs. Can you tell me the environment that I need 1,200 2.4 radios? I, did, I didn't think so. So, kind of want to get some Who thinks it's a wonderful idea to have two, two dual 5 gig APs? Start again. Okay, thank you. No, so who thinks it's a great idea to have two fi dual five gig access points? Come on, let me see your hands, put them up there. Who thinks it's a crazy idea and it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors? Few up there. Who here are just looking for knowledge and you're gonna make your own damn decision? See, that's how pollsters work. So that's how you wanna do it. And that's, that's kind of what we're gonna talk about here because it's important to understand when you're talking about um, dual five gig, what is possible, what isn't possible, and reality. I'm not gonna give you a pitch. Obviously, Aerohive has them, but that's not, this is gonna be kind of a vendor neutral presentation. So what's the problem with dual five gig designs? It, what? Potential interference. That's actually a good one. We got a lot of smart people in this room, right? Who's my CWNNEs? Let me see hands in here. So is noise a good thing or a bad thing? This is not an I it depends question. It's a bad thing, you all agree with that. So if you're designing a network, you have to design that network with zero noise. So the SNR has gotta be like 50, 60, 70. Doesn't happen, it's not how we look, it's not reality. So that's what it's all about, is designing networks appropriately. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna kinda talk about the evolution of the access point and the dual five gig. Um, dual five gig, whether you call it multi-state radios, uh, software defined radios, whatever term you want to use, it's the same thing. Understanding interference a little bit, um, network design, and how to deal with this, basically mitigation type stuff. So here's a traditional network design. Once again, don't worry about where the APs are. I'm just kind of giving you an idea behind here. So I've got an environment here. I got seven APs. For the numbers, if you're looking, I just used, you know, Two by two, 300 megabits per second on the 2.4. I use three by three, 1.3 gig on the, the uh, five gig. You can pick whatever numbers you want. We all know you can make up numbers all you want going forward. So that's a typical environment we have, traditional access points. So what's wrong with that? There might not be anything wrong with that. That might be a perfect design. That's an important thing to understand. When people talk about dual five gig, they're not talking about every AP has to have two five radios. Some will have both fives. Some will have a 2.4 and a five. Some might have a five and a sensor. Some might do in whips. It's, it's what you need. It's, it's what engineering is about, designing a network. If it was easy and it was plug and play, we wouldn't have jobs. Typically, they cost a little bit more, and a lot of times, we'll vendor will do that with the next technology upgrade. And the selection should be based on what the clients want. So historically, you go back, you look at, you know, we had 2.4 only way back in the day when I was still learning to do that. And by the way, 802.11, if you don't know, it became 21 years old today. So it's old enough to drink. So it's actually been a while for a while. Then we got the dual five. We got a 2.4 and a five gigahertz environment. And then in the last dozen years, the dual five gig came along. What's interesting up there is that bottom one, the vendors. And once again, this is not a marketing presentation, but it's important to understand. About 10, 12 years ago, you had a couple of vendors out there saying, you know, dual five gig is the only way, to, best way to go. And all the other vendors were saying, no, it's smoke and mirrors, too much noise, too much interference, it's never gonna work. A Couple years later, one of those vendors started to support dual five gig. And they said, hey, it works now because we did it right. And the other ones were saying, no, no, it still doesn't work. Then a couple years later, another one said, hey, we can support now because we did it right. And that's what happened three or four times. And you know something, to be honest, they were pretty, there was some truth in that. There were nuggets of truth in that because there's different ways to prevent the interference between those radios. There is gonna be interference. You got two five gigs sitting right next to each other. I don't care what channels you are, the potential for interference exists. So you need to be smart enough to deal with that. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So what we can do now is I've got this environment I just showed you but with a dual five gig capabilities, now I can do something more like this. 
that some of those APs, I'm going to leave the 2.4 on. Some, I'm going to put them both in 5 gig. It's a hell of a lot better than just turning off 2.4 radios. You know, if you're trying to defor the design in a large public venue or a stadium where you're deploying 2,000 APs, it just doesn't make sense to tell the customer, well, I'm going to turn off 1,500 of those AP radios you just bought. It it's hard to sell that. So the whole idea is to be smart about it. And you can use the math. Once again, you can set up the math any way you want, but understanding, you know, it's better to actually use the bandwidth than actually lose it. So that's important to understand. So what is noise? What is interference? As I said, the potential interference. Noise, CCI, ACI, RFI, EMI, pick whatever you want. I've got two transmitting devices that'll interfere with each other. The interference would actually cause lower data rates. And that's what we need to be concerned with. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's an important thing to understand. I'll give you a secret. We can filter this out later. If you have a two, two radios, two antennas sitting right next to each other on the same frequency, the five gigahertz, there will be some interference. But how do you deal with it? Do you just give up? Or do you figure out, how do I fix this? How do I use this? What's advantage of it? You know, if I just turned off that 2.4 radio, I got nothing. But if I did some smart stuff, maybe I can get something out of that radio. And that's what dual five gig is all about, and it's evolutionary. So RF interference, co-channel interference, adjacent channel interference, transmit and receives a big deal. Because if you're looking at a two radio AP, if I'm both transmit at the same time, both got real strong signals, it's probably not so bad. If I'm receiving at the same time, weaker signals, probably not so bad. Where you get an is issue is when one's transmitting and the other's receiving, because it really has a big opportunity to step on top of it and really impact the overall throughput. So you gotta design for that, you gotta think about that. And what becomes acceptable? Let's accept the fact that there will be some interference between those radios. What's an acceptable level of interference? Front. Thank you, it depends. I, once again, I'm, you're gonna get an award for this. And it really is, is getting 50% of throughput out of that radio enough to offset, just turn it off? 60%, 70%, 80%? That's what you wanna start thinking about. You don't wanna just start thinking about, hey, somebody told me it's not a good idea, so I'm not gonna turn it out. You guys are smart guys. And by the way, if you're a customer, Make them do a proof of concept. If a vendor comes in and say, five, do a five gig, it works greater than you can ever believe. Come here, prove it to me. Do it. If they can't do that, then go to somebody else. So once again, check it for yourself. Don't necessarily go read a blog. Don't read what's online. Pretty much that stuff changes. The great thing about what's on the internet is that what people said seven and eight years ago, it's still up there. So it's kind of interesting to go see what, what changed over the years. So the next thing, co-channel interference. That's the biggest challenge up there. I put two, channel 36, channel 36. Is this a good idea? Why? What does it cause? That's beyond the scope of today's presentation. <laughs> no, it's actually contention. There's nothing wrong with it. If you caught Peter's presentation of why he loves CCI. The whole idea that just one talks at a time. Okay, that's a stretch. But it actually kind of is a good presentation. If you haven't watched it, it's worth listening to it because it, that's how Wi-Fi works. But once again, kind of a, not a really good idea. So the whole idea is two radios and one AP on the same band, there will be some interference, period. End of conversation. We don't need to argue that point. So how do I mitigate that? Do I be a scientist? Do I do a mathematician that says, I can never get it perfect? Or can I be an engineer? and say, hey, you know, we can figure out. There's tools available. There's tools I can do. There's tools different vendors do. There's different ways you can do things with antennas. If you have any deep dive questions on that, I think you're supposed to find a ball guy. I'm not gonna get into that, so. But that's kind of what you deal with. So how do I mitigate that? How do I mitigate? I'm doing pretty good. I still got 29 minutes and 59 seconds to go. So I've done all that in a second. That's impressive. Um, <laughs> So there's different ways you can do that. First of all, I wanna do some isolation. So I can physically separate the antennas. I can use directional antennas and, and logically separate them. I can do some magic. We'll talk about magic. Um, Bandpass filtering and, and antenna polarization. I can use channel separation. Depending on the vendor, depending on what you read, I need 80 megahertz of separation, or 100, or 120, or three bandwidth wide, or as much as I can get. A little different options there. Channel width, how's this gonna affect bonding type? Power level per radio, I'll just turn one radio way down. Probably not a good idea. Transmit timing, bandpass filter. These are all things that different vendors have tried, not necessarily deployed, but tried different things. Because what it's all about, how much do I, how much attenuation do I need to get between those two radios? 
Anyone want to give me a number? How much do I need to knock down that signal? Exactly. It depends on who you ask. A lot of people say 40 or 50 dB. I need to dock down between them. Well, 80. Yeah, it's kind of tough to do that. Um, but the whole idea is not one of those is going to get you the numbers you're looking for. It just isn't going to happen. Maybe in a few years, maybe magic will come along and it might happen. But the idea is, what can I use? What multiple types can I use? And that's what we're going to talk about here. So selecting the right channel pairing is key. It really is. I mean, if I'm trying to do here 36 and 40, not a good idea. There's going to be interference between them, whatever you do. But maybe I do 36 and 144. Stretch them way out as far as possible. That gives me some advantage. And depending on who you read, who you listen to, that's going to give me 25, maybe 30 dB of separation. Three times the channel bandwidth, 80 megahertz, 120, whatever you can get is probably the right answer for that. What numbers you pick, I give some credit to Devin. He's got kind of an article if you want to do there a while back. You know, he picks some channels in there to pairings. This isn't rocket science. You know, some pick some channels, separate them, uni one, uni three. There's some regional issues out there. I mean, there's obviously some channels you can't use. There's DFS that creates a channel. Who here doesn't use DFS? Avoids it like the plague? Good, I love all you. Uh, not, not you, sorry. Because there was a discussion the other day that the FCC shot down extending uni 2B because it said if we give it to you, it's a DFS channel and you guys don't use it anyway. So kind of not a good idea for that. Or uni, yeah, 2B, 2C, whatever it was. So this is one of the things, you separate the channels. And be aware it's not just this clean. You got some funky stuff called intermodulation components. You know, just because I'm transmitting on channel 100 doesn't mean everything's clean. I mean, we all see that spectral mask. We just never see it goes all the way down and goes much, much further out. You've also got copies of the signal get replicated on other frequencies. So it's not a clean and dry thing. You kind of got to need the best you can with that. The next thing is I can use external antennas. I can stretch them out two feet, three feet, four feet, 20 feet, whatever I want. Physically separate the antennas. That's going to give me some advantage here. The next thing I do is power level adjustments. I can shrink one down real small. Not really a good idea, not something I really want to focus on in many environments, but it's been tried. Different people have tried different things. Not necessarily a good idea. But once again, we all know there's no such thing as a perfect network design. There's a lot of imperfect ones, and there's a lot of just wrong but there's no perfect ones depending on what you're trying to accomplish. The next thing is, and this is another bad idea, schedule transmission. You talk, I talk. You talk, I talk. Another pretty bad idea. You're going to lose a lot of efficiency, and basically, you're going back to contention again, and you're on two different channels. So not necessarily a great solution. One of the other ones, and one of the first ones that was implemented years and years ago, is directionality of antennas. And obviously, we talked about that a little bit before, is that I can do different things. I can take these antennas, and most of the time they're omnidirectional, 360. I can make them 180. I can make them 120. I can make them 90. I can make them 60. And by separating them out, I'm actually knocking down the potential of interference. I'm not eliminating it, but I'm attenuating it. And then if I can take those an uh, antennas and also install them octagonally to each other, I get some more advantage of it. So once again, these are the things that you guys can play with to actually get to that number that you want to get to. The next thing is, I can use a little bit of magic. I can use bandpass filters. The whole idea is I can say, OK, these frequencies are good. These frequencies are bad. I'm going to attenuate. I'm going to drop these frequencies right here. The problem is it's not clean. you got a roll-off issue, as I said before. So it's going to be stepping into the neighboring frequencies. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to design that. You've got to understand that. The next thing I can do is another magic trick, antenna polarization. Antennas, you can have vertical polarization, you can have horizontal polarization, you can have circular polarization. And by using this, wow, that's kind of weird. That's coming. Hey, Matthew, hope that wasn't important. Um, <laughs> I can get some advantage here, which means I'm able to talk. It's, you know, I can talk vertical, pol vertical polarization to a client, and it's not going to interfere as much with the other channel if it's actually doing a horizontal virtualization. And by the way, or, or um, polarization, as soon as the signal hits a wall, you know, the whole MIMO effect is going to change all that around. So it adds some value. The key point to understand here is not one of these methods is going to get you what you want. But you want to think about, and different, it, you're not going to do most of these. Obviously, you guys can do channel separation. But different clients are playing with different things. They're not just saying, OK, I've got this chips that I bought from vendor A. I'm uh, going to get their reference design. 
I'm going to give it to some company. They're going to build me. I'm going to put software on top and say, separate the channels and send it out. That is garbage. That is smoke and mirrors. That's not going to get you what you want. But you want to look at for the different vendors that are doing things. And once again, to be honest, over the last 12 years, there's been some neat functionality came in. What we can do today to isolate these radios is much better than what we could have done a decade ago. And what we can do two or three years from now is even going to get any better, is going to get some better. There's some actually discussion that, uh, you know, I don't know, get down the 11AX path, but OFDMA is going to help out a little bit in this area as far as isolating this stuff because of the way they use channels and bands. So the important thing to understand is it's not a cut and dry thing. Different vendors have different solutions. So once again, common sense says, I want to use all the radios I paid for. I don't want to turn any off. I don't want to start turning power down on ones to not interfere with the others. I want to see if I can use that radio. And so it is a real ROI here, but you need to make sure it does what you expect. So once again, whoever you're talking to, whatever vendor you're talking to, whatever product you're looking at, test it. Test it in real life. That's the key value here. So what happens now, what's going to be your channel plan? You know, I'm kind of a big believer in the 20 megahertz. You go to the 40 megahertz, you go to the 80 megahertz. I heard somebody the other day saying we need to go to 160 megahertz because with OFDMA, you only need one channel anyway. You know, yeah, who said that what? <laughs> but I won't mention who that was from and what company they're from, but most of you guys probably know. But the whole idea is stick with 20 megahertz wide. Do a channel plan, separate them by at least 80 megahertz, three times the bandwidth is what most people say. So if I got 20 megahertz channels, you know, go to at least 60, but a lot of times if I have a 20 and a 40, it has to be triple the 40, so I'm going up to 120. Separate as much as possible. You've got a certain amount of five gigahertz channels. Depending on where you are regionally, you've got a subset of that. Depending on where you are physically and the whole DFS things, you've got a subset of that. So you're gonna start with somewhere between eight, and 25 channels or so, figure out what that channel plan is. Once again, there's a lot of good blogs and there's a lot of good recommendations out there you can use. You can use a piece of paper in those funny looking cups that he passed out to Gregor and, and start figuring out, because that's the best way to do it. Because this actually kind of comes back to what we talked yesterday about whether I want to use the uh, RMMM, the RMM, the RMM, or the static design. You know, sometimes static design is better. You set it up, you fixed it, you set it, you leave it design, stable. Sometimes dynamic is better, but if you're actually doing this, you probably want to stick with a static design. And you're not going to deploy this everywhere. This is very, very important in high density type environments where you've got thousands of devices, thousands of users. You know, if I'm doing an education environment, I got 30 kids in a classroom, I might just put an AP in every classroom at 2.4 and a 5 and move on. It all depends on the environment. There is no right answer here, and that's the most important thing to think about. But it's also the wrong answer is to say, I'm not going to do this because I read an article that says, you know, this didn't work. Test for yourself. Every vendor, every reputable vendor out there will give you a proof of concept. They'll get you a kit out there. Test it yourself with your own testing scenario, not necessarily their testing scenario. So see what happens in real life. This is kind of a different look about a channel plan example. And this is probably the most important quote I, quote I like. If you don't think you're going to be able to do this, you probably can't. If you think, hey, I can figure this out, I know what's going on, you probably can. And that's probably the most important thing to think about because, once again, this, it shouldn't be an emotional topic, which it seems like it has been. It's just a different capability that exists. You're not going to use these everywhere, chances are. But once again, it's a tool in your toolbox, and there's definitely some places you want to deploy it. All right, I'm done a little early. Any questions on this? Everybody agrees with me now? Thank you very much. It depends. Hey, do we have any questions for Perry? No questions?